the, it's the, the ability to go with the flow in a creative way that allows what that core of humanity in one to flourish. And this will be that one has a nourishing, deep relationship with other human beings and with nature and with the realm of whatever you like to call it, the sacred, the divine. I believe those are the things that make us fulfilled as a human being. The, the social, the, the relationship with nature and the relationship with the sacred or divine. And it's not just my opinion, as I show at length, there's masses of evidence that these three things are the most important for making people happy, giving them psychological health, giving them physical health, which is astonishing, but it's true, um, and making them feel fulfilled and able to be resilient in meeting um, whatever um, interesting adventures life throws in our way. Dr. Ian McGilchrist, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks very much, Joe. Looking forward to talking with you. Amazing. So such a pleasure. So as I kind of mentioned to you off air, um, I was previously put onto your work uh, by Robert Green. Robert's been on the show uh, two times. Um, he strongly recommended to me uh, your book, the, the Master and His Emissary. Um, and I'm delighted that you've now brought out a uh, a new book, The Matter with Things, which is in two volumes, as you mentioned. It took about a decade to write, 591,000 words. Um, the reviews on it are absolutely insane. So I would just love to kind of kick off from there and just kind of ask you what it was that motivated you to write this new book. Yes, it was... Um... The realization um, that if I'm right in saying that the two hemispheres of the brain deliver two different versions of the world to us, if we ask the question, what can we rely on? What sort of truths can we get to know? Uh, it's important to take this into account because it will affect everything. You know, if, as I demonstrated in the, the Master and His Emissary, and I give a whole lot more interesting new information about that in my new book. If each hemisphere gives us a different world to experience, this is pretty important. Um, so it's a book that tr tries to answer the question, who are we? You know, who are, who are human beings? What are we? What are we doing here in this world? And how do we connect with that world? Because it seems to me that at the moment in our culture, we're completely um, at sea. Uh, we, we, we don't seem to have the foggiest idea of what life's about or why we're here. Um, so in order to answer that question, I needed to look at things like um, philosophy, obviously. And um, so it's a largely philosophical book. It, it, that may be an off-putting sounding word, but I'm really just asking the important questions. What, what is the universe like? Is it just random stuff hitting uh, chaotically in some bag of space that means nothing? Or is there a bit more to it than that? And I believe there is definitely much more to it than that. And the reason that we have fallen for this extraordinarily simplistic and simple minded idea that it's just mechanical, it's just, you know, reducible to lumps of matter. I think this is, uh, well, it's criminal and it's sad and it's deluding us. So I wanted to do something to, to um, break out of that really. And, and I can certainly uh, vouch that, um, you know, just if someone just types in, for instance, and kind of has a look at some of the uh, the praise and the comments that is received so far, it looks, you know, really, really worth your time. Um, but I'd love to kind of pick up um, and kind of, I guess, link your work together because you mentioned the two hemispheres um, of the brain. And I'm sure this is something that uh, our audience would, would love to, for us to talk about. So in the master and his emissary, um, you obviously made the case about, I guess, for a simplistic term, this divided brain, 
um, about you know the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And when I was uh, kind of told about the book, um, I will say this, and I, I will admit to you, I was kind of met with a bit of trepidation, um, with a bit of uncertainty, because you know being in, I guess, this kind of space, particularly coming from a neuroscience background, I thought, oh, you know, another book to tell me, you know, that the left does language and the, the right does much and all this, that and the other. But when I read the book, it was, whoa, it was really, really something. So I wonder, could you break down for our audience, I guess, the case that you make about these two hemispheres in the last book, and obviously your, your, your new book, is the, it starts off with neuroscience. So I wonder, could you kind of talk us through that argument? Yes, very, very um, briefly, of course. Sure. Um, but you're right. Uh, the first hurdle I have to get over is that everybody thinks they know that any differences between the brain hemispheres are rubbish and it's all pop science and it's been exploded years ago. What you have to differentiate between is what indeed was said perhaps 30, 40 years ago and what we now know, because it's a non-starter to try and claim that there are no important differences between the hemispheres. Any neurologist will tell you that it matters very much if there's damage or uh, to one hemisphere in a certain place it'll be quite different for the person who's suffering it from what it would be like if they had the injury in the exact mirror image place in the other hemisphere. So they're obviously doing quite different things, that's for sure. Um, and the, the two halves of the brain are very largely separated. As, as you know, there's a band of fibres at the base, base of the brain called the corpus callosum, which unites the two hemispheres. But only 2% of neurons actually cross uh, that link. And the two hemispheres are asymmetrical as well. Why is that? And not just ours, but looking at other animals. They, they have this structure. It seems like a terrific waste. If the brain has its power just because it makes connections, why is it spending so much time keeping them apart? And what I think has happened in brief is that we mistook the brain for a machine. And so we asked, what does it do? And we got these rather silly answers that, well, the left does language and reason and the right does emotion and pictures. And from this, all kinds of unrealistic things have um, been said. But that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't look at this situation, this barn door problem, or, or, or uh, if you like, uh, opportunity uh, to investigate more about ourselves um, and see what the real truth is. And in a nutshell, it's not about the what, it's about the how. So both hemispheres deal with language, in fact. Both hemispheres are. Uh, responsible for the expression and the appreciation of emotions. And um, both hemispheres are involved in visuospatial uh, tasks. Uh, both hemispheres um, do, frankly, everything, uh, including reason, mathematics, and all these things. So just, I'd say to people who are listening, could you please put out of your mind everything you've heard about this and start again? So what I discovered is that it's about attention basically. That is the most important point. Why is there a difference between the two hemispheres in the way in which they pay attention? And why is the same difference to be found in other animals, not just mammals, reptiles, amphibians, but going actually all the way down to the most simple neural networks that we know of 700 million years ago, they're already asymmetrical. And this seems to be to do with a survival problem. In order to survive, you have to be able to get stuff to eat or perhaps to build a nest or whatever. You need to be able to manipulate the world. For that, you need a very narrow beam, highly precisely uh, focused and already targeted attention to something you know you want to get. Fine. One hemisphere, the left hemisphere, does that. But if that's all the brain was doing, it would be missing everything else that's going on, like the predator who's looking out for you while you're getting your lunch, you become somebody else's. Or for your kin, or for, you know, everything that's going on in the environment around you. And it, it turns out that because we need to, these two things to be going on all the time together, the only way this can be done is by having two 
large neuronal nets, each of which capable of attending to the world, but each in a different way. And it might not sound that remarkable or interesting that there is these differences in attention, but actually attention changes the world. I call it a moral act because how we attend actually changes what we find in the world and it changes, changes also ourselves we who are doing the attending, if we have a very uh, constantly detached and particularistic way of looking at the world, we will become a certain kind of person. Um, what are these basic differences? I can say quite briefly in, in a couple of sentences. When you pay this already committed, targeted attention to something very tiny, you end up with a picture of the world as made up of tiny bits and pieces that represent opportunities to you to grab and get them. They are relatively fixed, relatively familiar, pretty much taken out of context, um, put into categories, um, abstracted from their embodied being, made utterly explicit, and completely devitalized. So you've got a universe of bits, a chaos of bits, the one that in fact nowadays we're asked to accept is the reality. But the right hemisphere, meanwhile, is seeing something completely different. It's seeing that everything um, is ultimately interconnected, that it's always changing and flowing, that you can't take something out of its context without changing utterly its meaning, that much of the things in the world that we value, or, or the aspects of the world, I should say, that we value, are only valuable when they're implicit. Once they're made explicit, they're ruined. You know, if you have to explain a joke, it's no longer a joke. If I have to unpack a poem, you've lost the poem. So a very important area of meaning there in the right hemisphere. So one that is continually changing, a new, contains uniqueness, uh, embodiedness, a context and effectively an animate world. And that's the one that belongs to the right hemisphere, which has no speech. So the difference between speech and language, they both contribute to language. The right hemisphere contributes some of the most important aspects of language. But the, in right handers, 97% of us have speech only in the left hemisphere. And it's much easier for the speech that the left hemisphere has evolved to reflect what the left hemisphere knows, which is simple linear structures. Whereas what the right hemisphere sees, a, com a complex a whole, which is constantly ramifying and has, you know, is, is pregnant with meaning, is a much harder thing to express. Very, very well said. And I think that uh, just one point that I would love to pick up on, I guess, before I tie, go back to the brain, is that you said, you know, that if you have to unpack a poem, it, it loses a little bit of its you know, the effect of the poem. And I think that we kind of see this all too often in the modern world. You know, I mean, even, mm. for instance, people do this, they do this with love. Uh, they do this with art. And I know that you say to uh, you say in the book, all that matters most to us can be understood only by the indirect path. Music, art, mm. humor, poems, love, metaphors, and religious meanings are all nullified by the attempt to make them explicit. So I wonder, could you kind of go a little bit deeper on that point? Well, at one stage in my life, um, I was professionally taking a philosophical interest in literature and teaching literature, certainly researching it. And it occurred to me that what a poem or any work of art for that matter is, is something that is unique. You know, a bad work of art may not be unique. You could have thought of it and made it out of bits of others, but a really good one is unique and it's embodied. So when you read a poem, you're not just using your sort of calculating mind. You're also using your embodied mind, which has all the emotional depth and complexity uh, of that information. And you're also, um, as you quite rightly point out, you're dealing with something that can only be implicit. Once it's made explicit, it suddenly lost its power. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book in my 20s called Against Criticism, which was published by Faber. And I then uh, went to um, medicine because my philosophical interests were not satisfied by seminars on the mind-body problem, which I felt 
was what we were really looking at here, that something embodied had been made utterly disembodied. Um, and so I then went into medicine. And so in that, I saw that the way in which we attend to everything most important is in that world as well as in the world of the arts, something that is indirect. If it's proceduralized and put into a manual and there's a flow diagram and a lot, um, an algorithm for how you do it, you've made it completely inhuman. Occasionally you meet doctors who seem to their patients quite correctly, to have sort of ingested a computer generated diagram of how to deal with a human being. But <laughs> it, this is not a good way to, to create empathy, or, or to link to what your patient is actually suffering. So I, I think I see it all across the modern world, you know, that sex has become utterly Im explicit. And as a such lost a lot of its power. It's always said about the Victorians, that they left sex implicit and thereby it remained very powerful for them they, they they had a great deal of romantic interest in people in the world uh, that we perhaps don't have they made explicit death and by making death explicit you rob it of some of its power whereas we don't talk about death so it's become the thing that actually haunts us you know it's a strange paradox that as people discover apparently that the world means very little if anything they want to hang on to life for as long as possible well it doesn't really add up does it <laughs> no most certainly and I, I i there's so many points that i want to pick up on but you kind of mentioned a bit about um your background and to me it seems like um you know one of the key points that you are trying to get across with the matter of things it seems to be a real um uniting message because it seems to me like all too often in this world things are polarized it is left mm -hmm. it's right you're an evolutionist you're a, a a believer um you know you're in the humanities you're in the science one of the things that i found interesting about you when i was researching was that as you mentioned, there you were a, a scholar of English literature, and then you transitioned into medicine. Now, in my experience, that is uh, atypical, should we say? I don't know anyone else that has has done that, um, and that seems to me kind of um, a kind of cro a cross in fields. And I actually had this uh, conversation with A. C. Grayling, and uh, he made a, a similar point to me. He said that you know the the philosophies. Uh, the humanities, the sciences, he says that they are kind of loggerheads with each other when it shouldn't be that way. So I wonder yeah. um, mm. kind of how has your own background, your own development of crossing fields, how has that kind of informed your thinking and the way that you present ideas today? Undoubtedly in a huge way. Um, I, I, in, in dealing with the humanities, um, really uh, both studying literature and philosophizing about it uh, i was aware that the black and white approach of which is actually one of the things the left hemisphere loves is a clear-cut black and white is it this or is it that whereas the right hemisphere says well maybe it's a bit of both um it, it can be both and whereas the left hemisphere is only either or and so i think that being able to stand with one foot in the humanities and one in science has been enormously important for me, both for the development of my ideas and for simply the practice of medicine. So uh, yes, I think that is a very good point. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so if we kind of go back to um, kind of the earlier points that we were talking about, um, you kind of obviously just just um, uh, illustrated the fact that perhaps the left uh, regions of the brain, they can have kind of black and white tendencies, the right uh, hemisphere, they can have kind of more uh, gray area. Uh, a very good, mm -hmm. um, perhaps, example of this might be the, uh, the neuroanatomist, uh, Jill mm -hmm. Taylor, who suffered uh, a left mm -hmm. hemisphere um, stroke. And then I know that in her TED talk, she describes the 
the bliss and uh, the oneness, if you will. I wonder, could you kind of talk about this example, if you're aware of it, and kind of perhaps any lessons that we could take from it? Well, I know Jim Balty Taylor, um, and um, I, uh, a company made a film about my work called The Divided Brain, and we interviewed her for that, and I, I know her descriptions very well. I think that, to be fair, uh, there's a difference between what she felt in the middle of this cataclysmic event and what she felt perhaps chronically afterwards. But I think when the brain is, as it were, in meltdown and neurons are being destroyed, they're spilling neurotransmitters um, at, at a rate of knots. <laughs> and um, so what one experiences can be uh, something that one might only expect to experience in an altered state of consciousness. But I think that also she, I mean, think she would accept that, but she'd also go further and say that she's become more in touch really with other people and with the world. And there's no doubt about this. Um, the right hemisphere is more in touch with reality for one thing. Uh, that's what part one of my new book, 400 pages, is about when you compare the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, which of them is more veridical, which of them is better able to correspond with the reality? And the answer is the right hemisphere. Pretty much all delusions and hallucinations, certainly the gross ones, come from damage to the right hemisphere, not from damage to the left hemisphere. So it's our anchor in reality. But it's also the ground of empathy and fellow feeling, which is a terrifically important element, uh, perhaps more difficult to find these days in uh, you know public discourse. Um, and there's a lot of literature on people who've had perhaps a dementia that largely affects their left hemisphere, so that the right hemisphere comes to the fore. And people describe their relative as having changed personality for the better. Whereas when it's the other way around, they describe the, where the left hemisphere is preserved, but the right hemisphere is damaged. They describe that the person has become um, uh, somehow uh, emotionless. Um, they no longer have rapport or empathy with people. They don't understand what people mean, because all the indirect expression, which is most of what we do when we're communicating, is lost. And that they can actually become rather aggressive and selfish. So, you know, there are moral implications. I, I, there's a whole chapter on that. and it, I don't want to make remarks that will sound trivial, but there really are important moral differences between the compass of the left hemisphere and of the right. I know that uh, Carl Jung, uh, I guess, to kind of simplify the point, I know that he believed that a transition back from ego, I guess, you could perhaps link that to the left hemisphere, from the ego to self, which I guess perhaps in your uh, argument is the right hemisphere was the meaning of life. Do, would you uh, agree with this? Do you share any kind of similarities in your kind of views to Young? I do very much. Um, not that I've been a, a, an avid student of Jung, but uh, from time to time, I've found ideas in Jung that are so important um that they they resonate so much with my 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 own thinking um that it would be um impossible not to feel that he was um, a very important figure for the kind of philosophy i'm trying to put forward and he does distinguish as you say between the ego and the self and what he's pointing to is that early in life the infant is actually fused with the mother doesn't realize that it's separate from the mother and uh, over you know the first months and year or so that child has to learn that it is separate from the mother and then it has to establish itself as a separate being and this is the ego which is kind of the self as separate or different or distinct but as one hopes <laughs> the human being matures then that sense is replaced by one which I think is a very important one. We are never just ourselves somehow um, randomly created and randomly plonked down into the world. We, we come out of a society, we're created by our family, by the society around us, 
we're social beings and at the end of our life we hope to have given something back to society as well so uh, the, the, this this is a quite different idea it wouldn't be better whatever uh, people who've got a vague acquaintance with oriental mysticism uh, may think it wouldn't be better if we had no sense of self at all people in psychiatry who have no sense of self are some of the hardest um, to treat and some of the most distressed you can find schizophrenia in schizophrenia people have no clear sense of themselves and feel that they may be melting into other people and another quite different but nonetheless extremely important condition is borderline personality disorder in which people have no stable sense of themselves so having a stable sense of yourself is very important but it doesn't make you selfish that would be egoism whereas in fact what one is doing is seeing the self as connected with the world world wonderful wonderful I, 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 again i'm racing with ideas but as you mentioned schizophrenia I wonder if perhaps we could kind of talk about um, the big picture effects of perhaps what this line of thinking may lead us to. And I know you say, again, very eloquently in the book, you can see your, your background in, in English, you say excessive abstraction has been described as probably at the source of cognitive deficit in schizophrenia, living in the map, not the world words that refer only to other words, abstractions that become more real than actualities, symbols that usurp the power of what they symbolize, the triumph of theory over embodied experience. I believe there are resonances here with academic trends in the humanities, with scientism, and even with the world picture of the average Western citizen. So this kind of thinking, I wonder perhaps, could we talk about the costs that this had and where it could lead us to perhaps yes i mean perhaps i should say um to, to give the context a little that uh, i argue in the second half of the master and his emissary that societies can either balance the contributions of the left and right hemisphere which is the perfect situation um, or they can become um, overwhelmed by, it seems always, the left hemisphere's take eventually. Um, and, and there are a number of reasons why this tends to happen, but I think that we're in that situation now, that it, certainly in the last 150 years, we've drifted very strongly towards the world picture, which would come to somebody who, as it were, were not listening at all to the right hemisphere. Um, and, and this is a very impoverished picture. Uh, it is actually like a map compared with the world that is mapped. The right hemisphere, as it were, experiences the world as it's happening. The left hemisphere is busy creating a map. And, you know, a map is as useful um, as useful as the information it leaves out. You don't want a map to contain all the information it could possibly find about the world. It would be hopeless. You couldn't use it. It has to be very, very simple just to give the skeleton and that enables you to use it. But we're now living in a world in which we think what the map shows is the reality. But they're wholly different as I may have given, I hope, um, some understanding from my characterization of how the world seems in the left hemisphere simple schematic abstracted and how it seems in the right hemisphere complex living and interconnected so um that's that's the position that i hold and i was very struck by um a, a book that i always mention which i read in 1992 in fact when i was in baltimore doing neuroimaging on, on um, asymmetries in the brain um, and it's a book by Louis Sass, S A double -S, S, um, a distinguished American psychologist. And he suggests that many of the features of modernism and postmodernism in its art, literature, and thought resemble the experiences of patients with schizophrenia. And he, this is really extraordinary. And he, he, he elaborates that beautifully in this book. It's very lucidly written. But of course, it isn't that everybody's suddenly got schizophrenia, that, that can't be the case. But what I think is the case is that we've ceased to listen 
to what the right hemisphere can tell us or to believe in the sort of picture of the world that the right hemisphere can bring into being for us. And this is what happens to people in schizophrenia too, and in certain kinds of autism. They become somewhat um, like machines, they find it very difficult to understand human meaning, um, they become rather literal minded, they become um, obsessed with schemas rather than with the unique case, uh, which requires some um, flexibility in response from the observer or the interactor. So that's, I think, what, what I would say is that when you look around the modern world, you see lots of things that point to this. I mean, one of them you've already mentioned, which is the extraordinary debasement of public discourse by shouting mobs on the left and right saying, no, it's like this, no, it's like that. This kind of ya boo sucks anyway, you stink mentality, which seems to be the playground <laughs> in which in which we now conduct every kind of debate on all the most important topics. This is typical of the left hemisphere, extreme, black and white, no subtlety. Then there's the constant encroachment on everything of effectively bureaucracy. Um, the manuals, the, the flow diagrams, the algorithms that we're supposedly following, the boxes that we have to tick, is a way of destroying everything subtle, and that means everything that's important to us, in a culture. We once had a living culture, a, a live civilization. I'm very much afraid that we'd be, we'd we're doing such toxic things to it now that I don't know whether it will survive. I hope it will. I certainly want to do everything I can do to help, and I imagine your listeners will too. But that means resisting the this way of thinking that, you know, nothing is unique. Everything is just an example of a set or category now. Um, all the subtlety of meaning has been driven out. And I, I sometimes, and at the end of that book, I do describe what would the world look like if in fact I was right that the left hemisphere view had taken over. And there's about four or five pages of this. And uh, very few readers, if any, have failed to spot that actually it's a description of the world in which we now live. That's a, a worrying thought. Um, but I would love to kind of just wrap up this, I guess, this hemisphere hypothesis. Um, well, I say hypothesis. I mean, you have you know, probably many thousands of, of research studies that have gone. No, it's a hypothesis. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so I would love to just kind of like just wrap this up. And I would love to um, kind of ask, because you've already mentioned, I guess, one very useful tip so far, and that is be, be mindful, essentially, of making beautiful phenomena explicit and um you know things like death you could make that explicit but, but you know beauty love and <laughs> everything else be mindful of making that explicit so i wonder mm. if you could perhaps give um perhaps a practical tip or something that you've used uh based on the hemisphere hypothesis that we can use that our audience can use that we can be mindful of to perhaps uh, go about operationalizing our brain for a a better mode of functioning, if that makes yeah. any sense. Yes, I, I can. Though I think that the probably important changes will have to take place at a higher level than the individual. But I still think that all movements for a, a change begin with individuals working on themselves and the world that's immediately around them. So it's a very good question to ask. And um, I'm not a, offering self help. But I think there are important things. One of the things them you have indirectly mentioned the word mindful a number of times. And I think mindfulness, the business of stopping chattering about the world in your head, stilling monkey mind as as the um, Buddhists call it, and being present for once with the world without judging it without verbalizing it and actually experiencing it as it's coming into being in front of you. That is one thing and I think it should be taught to children in school. Another is to spend more time in practicing things like music, reading poetry, dance, drama, all these things are ways of engaging 
the mind at a much subtler level in which all kinds of complex things can be held. When you do take apart um, a, a work of art, you find this an enormous amount there. I mean, it's now lost its power because since you've made it very explicit, but there's a lot going on there, far more than can be made to happen in an explicit sentence or two. You have to narrow down all the stuff you're experiencing and knowing when you when you read or, or, or state, I should say, a, a, a sentence, a logical sentence in an argument. But your mind is also aware of the, all kinds of things that may be going on, like the, the things that are the opposite of what you're saying are also true. A very important finding that in these deep areas of philosophy, certainly when it comes to spirituality or religion, um, and in modern physics, as Niels Bohr pointed out, the only language we can use is poetry. So I think the general trend to mechanize, operationalize, and eventually perhaps to scrub out altogether the humanities from children's education is a disaster. Um, I know that when people are very, very busy. They think, well, you know, I've been busy all day doing the real business, sitting in an office under strip lighting, making money on a computer. Um, now I'll go to the theatre or to the opera for a bit of light entertainment. But I would say this is exactly the other way around, that what you've been doing during the day is is a, just a phantom. It's, it's an image. It's not really living at all. But when you engage with the theatre, with the opera, you're actually for once experiencing something very profound. So, you know, the, we've got our sense of what's important back to front, in my view. I mean, there are other things that, that we can do, but they they start from the business of being aware. And so many people have written to me saying that after reading, usually after reading the, the, the first book, The Master and His Emissary, because my new book's only been out for a few months, but they say, you know, I can report that since reading your book, my life has changed. I think quite differently about almost everything. What you're telling us can be applied to everything in our experience, which I think is true. And it's changed who I am. And, you know, I work better and my wife likes me more or whatever it may be. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't start, start out, as I say, to write any kind of self-help book. But nonetheless, it turns out, miraculously, that my book does help effect change. Absolutely. And I think that a key point to you is that uh, I think that particularly, I, I would even implicate myself in this, in the sense that I think that a major issue that, you know, you've described coming, coming back to this point about making beautiful things explicit, trying to deconstruct love or, um, you know, awe inspiring things is that in a sense that when you do that, it seems to me that you sell a sense of wonderment for a feeling of control. And, you know, if I try to boil down the feeling of love to simple neurochemistry, it does take away from the magical experience. Uh, do you kind of see it like that in some way? I do. Uh, and um, I thought that was a lovely thing you said about some... Um... I can't remember your words exactly, but you were so sort of... Uh, for control. Yeah, that's it. Because the, the raison d'etre of the left hemisphere is power, it's control. And the only value that we now seem to respect is power and the powerful. Um, but actually all the other things that we ought to be valuing, like truth and beauty and goodness, just to name a few, um, seems to have been that's de-emphasized and to some extent absent from the discourse. So yes, I, I think that is the way um, one can see things going. And I I, um, I think the, the question of values is a very important one. And I find that it's not often discussed, but when I raise it, people think, yes, the question of values is an extremely important one. It's at the root of, of what we're what I'm saying is that we we have commodified everything in order that it should be a resource. So nature is a resource we can mine for stuff that will be useful in making technical equipment, for example. 
or um, we can even what I've recommended, like meditation, uh, it's good for lowering my blood pressure and may make me more effective at my job. But if you're doing it for that reason, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons, because the only reason for embracing these things is because they are in themselves good. They are in themselves part of the reason that we're here to know these things, to grow them in ourselves, because they do grow through practice. And if you've never practiced it, they won't have grown. But the seed is there to nourish if you want to do it. One thing I ought to say is that I'm not against um, analysis. It's just that there's one thing that's much more important than analysis even, and that's seeing the whole. And these are not conflicting. They're different stages of a process. So uh, I sometimes give the example of learning a piece of music. You hear the piece of music as a whole. It's a new experience. The right hemisphere takes it in, as it does all new experiences. And then you think, I'd like to play that. And if you've ever learned to play an instrument, you know that there's a lot of sweat and hard work that goes in and you have to practice certain passages over and over again, out of context. And you look at the thing and you understand the theory of the structure of the piece. So here we return to the tonic and that kind of thing. But when you go on stage to perform, you must forget all of that. But it doesn't mean it wasn't ever worth anything. The good in it has been taken up implicitly into your performance. So that must be, go from the explicit world of the left hemisphere back into the implicit world of the left of the right hemisphere, where it, um, if you like, nourishes and expands the power and the beauty of what it is seeing. Very, very beautifully said once again. And I would love to um, kind of just, uh, I guess, change gears. And uh, yes. and uh, one thing that I know is kind of developed a bad rep in uh, this perhaps this this modern day that we live in is intuition uh mm -hmm. do you have any mm -hmm. any thoughts on perhaps the the bad rep that it's it's developed yes I, well i suspect you may have <clears throat> read um a couple of chapters of uh, this new book on intuition and um yes i think the in short that um it has had um, a pretty bad press lately, which it doesn't wholly deserve. Uh, certainly not um, anywhere near the extent that is um, that is now put forward by academics who show us that sometimes our intuitions are mistaken. That is granted. But sometimes simply reasoning on something purely logically will lead you to a mistake as well, as it does for people with schizophrenia. One of the problems for them is not that they're, um, they've lost their reason, but that they can only reason. They have no sense of intuition about life. They've lost that and they have to substitute for it. A very clunky mechanical logic. And I, I sometimes say, you know, these interesting examples where our intuitions led us astray. And um, I, I can show you optical illusions, which you simply can't believe. But I've never known anyone say after looking at one of these optical illusions, well, that does it. I'm never going to use my eyes again because they can occasionally let you down. It's true. But 99% of the time, they're absolutely essential. And 99% of the time, intuition must be part of the mix. It only stops being part of the mix when you are simply following out a, a logical procedure, doing an equation. But if you're actually reasoning about the world, which is not the same as just carrying out rational procedures in the way a computer would, but reasoning about it in the way that somebody who's um, sophisticatedly educated, has the capacity to use their intuition in balance with reason and use their imagination to understand things, um, you know, in those situations, we very much need to have intuition as part of the mix. And in short, I've looked at the four main ways in which most people would say we might get a handle on the truth. And these I take to be science, reason, intuition and imagination. And what I suggest is that all four of these are important, whereas most of the time we only use one or perhaps two. And in each case, interestingly, it's the left hemisphere, sorry, it's, it's not the left hemisphere, it's the right hemisphere that is the more important one, including in maths, in science, and so on. So the split is not 
may I emphasize, between the left hemisphere and science on the one hand, and the right hemisphere and the humanities on the other. It's between relatively dogmatic, workaday science and times tables in the left hemisphere, but great mathematical insight solving the problems of science requires the right hemisphere to be the one that's more active. And that, that reminds me of that phrase, reminds me that something I haven't mentioned, but perhaps ought to, is that the left hemisphere is a very good servant, but a very poor master. In other words, it shouldn't be the one that's in charge of this um, of this pair. Uh, the one that needs to be in charge is the right hemisphere. It can direct the left hemisphere to do certain procedures that are very familiar to it. And it can do those with, with great ease because they're very known and familiar and practiced and so on. But once the situation is complex or new in any way, the right hemisphere needs to set to work and say, hang on, I'm looking at this, you know. And the left hemisphere needs to actually take its lead from the right hemisphere. But we now live in a world, world in which, as Einstein reportedly suggested, that the, the, what should be the servant has become the master. And we've forgotten the precious gift, which is that of intuition. So I, I'm not at loggerheads with science. I am a scientist. I'm not at loggerheads with reason. I, as people constantly point out, you rely an awful lot on reason and science. Isn't that rather left hemisphere of you? No, it's not. <laughs> right, right. We, we've thought too much and we've felt too little in this this modern world. Um, but yeah. yeah, just just a couple, um, just a, a, mm. a, a quick fire question, I mm. guess. Um, I know that, for instance, in the books that I've read on spirituality or religion, or the divine or the sacred, I can imagine these are very, very difficult to write about. What was that like? Yes, writing the, the last substantive chapter of this book, which is called The Sense of the Sacred, um, was the most difficult thing I've ever done without any question. It, it caused me more pain and trouble than anything else I've written. Um, and inevitably it's still um, work in progress because one can never um, be more than uh, pointing towards something. You can't actually state it in so many words. Otherwise, once again, you've not stated it. This is why in all religious traditions, there is an embargo on saying the word that is the name of whatever this grounding being is. Uh, we do use the word God, but it, it, it gets so misunderstood that it can be a a way of getting between us and any kind of spiritual growth. Um, and in Taoism, which I'm particularly fond of, the first words of the most famous text, the Tao Te Ching, are the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. Mm -hmm. so it's a very important point. So I, yes, I found that extraordinarily difficult. And some of my colleagues said, you know, you really shouldn't do this. Um, because your book is full of very interesting philosophy. Philosophers, academic philosophers will love it, but they won't forgive you for writing about the sacred. <laughs> and, um, well, it hasn't actually happened to me like that yet, but we, it was time, I suppose, for this to, to happen. And I'm glad I didn't miss it out, because it, missing it out would suggest that it's just not important. It, it had never come to mind for me. But it has always come to mind for me as something the most difficult to talk about, and yet one of the most important things, or elements, I should say, in our experience. Right, and I, I can imagine uh, that that will probably give you a, a greater sense of meaning which will inform my next question and the question that we sign off all of our podcasts with before I ask you to tell these guys where they can connect with you any work that you're excited about um, and anything else where you want to send out guys but the last question that I sign off all our podcasts with is what makes a life worth living Wow. Um, well, I think working with the flow of life rather than struggling with the mechanism of life. There are two ways in which life can be thought of, at least. And the one that is most commonly thought of is that of it being some kind of a machine that we can use. 
if we're lucky. But much more than that, I feel it is a flow, and we haven't time to unpack why that is so important, but in my work I do talk about it. And it's the, the ability to go with the flow in a creative way that allows what that core of humanity in one to flourish. And this will be that one has a nourishing, deep relationship with other human beings and with nature and with the realm of whatever you like to call it, the sacred, the divine. I believe those are the things that make us fulfilled as a human being. The, the social, the, the relationship with nature and the relationship with the sacred or divine. And it's not just my opinion, as I show at length, there's masses of evidence that these three things are the most important for making people happy, giving them psychological health, giving them physical health, which is astonishing, but it's true, um, and making them feel fulfilled and able to be resilient in meeting um, whatever um, interesting adventures life throws in our way. So it might, at first glance, be fairly obvious why so many of us are so stressed, so unfulfilled, so anxious, so depressed, because we've actually done our best to destroy social cohesiveness. Um, we've done our best to vandalize and subdue nature, and we box ourselves up in little urban boxes instead of living alongside it in the rhythms of it, in the depths of communion with it. And we've also decided that really only um, perhaps simpletons uh, still believe that there might be something like the divine or a soul or, or God. Whereas in my view, uh, only simpletons um, dismiss that possibility. I don't say they have to embrace it, but I think what gives um, gives away that people aren't really thinking very well and are completely under the sway of the left hemisphere is people who just outright fundamentalist atheists, very much like fundamentalist believers, be they Muslim, Christian or anything else. Fundamentalism is the dogma of the left hemisphere, getting away from that, leading a much more subtle, nuanced life is the one that I would suggest we try to cultivate. Very, very, very well said. Uh, where can uh, our audience uh, connect with you? Where would you like to, to send them? Is there any part in messages or, or directions that you want them to go in? Well, I mean, apart from obviously encouraging people to take the plunge and buy, buy my books, um, I have a website called Channel McGilchrist. It has a lot of information about what I'm doing, but also um, an, an enormous number of talks, of interviews, of podcasts, and so forth, all in the uh, free access part of my website. If you particularly like what you find there and want to go deeper, you can be a member, but you don't have to become a member in order to get things from it. And through that, you can also contact uh, me, um, and uh, those who are members actually get sessions when I answer their questions live amazing this has been such a privilege for me and the depth of your thought the clarity of of the writing of the communication um and also of the content i mean it's it's uh it can be stark but it can also be very empowering um so i really 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 appreciate the message everything will be linked below uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>